in this business 70, 80 years ago. And that time, we used to crank, it was an old Edison machine, we used to crank art with bigger films, only five minutes. And the first job I had, it was on the Crystal Hall on 14th Street, New York. A little later, we started with the sun, and we had the record and films. But many times, the needle jumped off the record, and boy, that it was hell. We had to take off the reel from the machine, and rewind again, and start all over again. I, uh, I work on the Astro in New York, and many, many theaters. And the last job, it was in, in the King. To close this theater. That's something that anybody can feel. Well, I retired when I was 89 years old, and this was my last job because. When I heard this theater be closed, I couldn't work anymore. Rap and Rap, the great Chicago architectural firm which designed the Kings, did not foresee that their theaters could close. They thought that they were built to last forever. But the Kings had its troubles from the beginning. It opened its doors on Flatbush Avenue just in time, shortly before the stock market crash of 1929. Had it been planned for a little later, it might never have opened due to the Depression. Lowell's theaters built mighty fortresses and dream palaces, often in neighborhoods where most of the buildings were anything but palatial. Going to the Kings, the most lavish of Flatbush's theaters, was the next best thing to going to the city. And for several years, its films were accompanied by stage shows and vaudeville acts, imported directly from the Capitol on Broadway. The Kings was decorated by Harold W. Rambush, whose firm also specialized in the decoration of churches. It's a wonderful experience to come here to the King's Theatre, which I have not visited during the last 50 years when I actually worked on it. To enter these lobbies that are so lush and rich in their expense and in their concept of design. And we wonder really how these owners and operators and producers of movies who built the theaters, why they made them so rich. Because they had, whether knowingly or unknowingly, realized that besides showing a picture and entertaining the people, they wanted to give them a lift, give them a sense of their own importance. And the public who came into these theaters were, for a short time, for the hours they were here, they felt like kings or barons or wealthy people. So we find in lighting, in mirrors, in murals, in architectural elaboration, it was largely on the Renaissance. A real historian or architectural expert would feel that this was really bastardizing architecture it, because it was not correct according to any style. Every effort was just made to make it as voluptuous, as gorgeous as possible. 
no restraint of any kind was put on if if an effect could be attained in some more or less legitimate historical manner it was used because it was purely show business Around the corner and down your way comes Arthur Tracy, your street singer. you bloom in the wild wood and I hoped you'd be mine Oh, how wonderful to be back in this King's Theatre again singing on its stage brings back the orchestra, the conductor beautiful audiences Besides the piano, my violin there were 25 other musicians at the opening of the King's Theatre. The orchestra was conducted by David Pazansky. It was a gala affair that opening week when we played for the opening movie in which Dolores Del Rio was a star. We also played a couple of overtures and accompanied several other famous, then famous actors and actresses who appeared at the opening. Vaudeville began years and years ago with such big names as Eddie Leonard, Eddie Foy and the Seven Foys, Julius Tannen, and as the people came, the theaters grew. You had people like Al Jolson come in, Eddie Cantor, Schnauzer Durante. The theaters turned into big palaces, palaces all over the city and in the hinterland, in the suburbs. And it was a great pleasure to come into a theater like King's and every visit to find the same people, the same faces sitting in the same seats. For most of us, that is kids of my age, my generation, our parents came over from the old country, very poor. Rarely did they get into a palace as gorgeous as this. And rarely would they ever have dreamt that their children would every Saturday come into their own palace, place themselves, and for three hours, behold magic. I'm standing in the middle of the organ lift here at Lowe's King's Theater. The organ lift is the only thing that is left of the instrument. The organ which was here was known as a Wonder Morton because these theaters were wonder theaters and as you can see they really were wonderful the organ was installed in 1929 about the time that the silent film era was ending they were certainly the one of the most intricate things that you can imagine they were built specifically of course to accompany silent films but since the silent film era was over, they were, of course, used for various other things. You couldn't believe the things that, that we were required to play. The popular music of the day, Tchaikovsky, Bach, whatever there was, that's what we had to do. You have to understand that this was the Depression, and where else, for 10 cents, could you be transported from the slums of East New York and Brownsville, where one street looked like another, where people weren't working, and you suddenly came into this magnificent edifice. Even in a gilded dream palace, you were often jolted back for a few minutes to the harsh realities of the world outside. Well-known personalities made pitches for worthy causes, the March of Dimes, the Will Rogers Fund, the unemployed. If you could afford the price of admission, then you were expected to shell out a few cents for those who could not. And in these cathedrals of the motion picture, the ushers took up the collection for these secular causes as if you were in church. Thousands 
of unemployed men and women today are struggling to keep their homes and families together. Won't you help them by sharing your better fortune with them? Remember, sharing does not hurt like suffering. You got a horn of plenty at the movies in those days. You got Gable and Colbert in It Happened One Night. William Powell and Myrna Loy in The Thin Man. As second or B picture, you might get Gene Autry and Roy Rogers and their horses. Stormy day, wild seas lash the... The newsreel with the important events of the day and the trivia. The storm gods are angry. All over the continent, the elements... And you got FDR, a great star at the Lowe's Kings, the only president held over by popular demand on the screen of the newsreels for three terms. And the Oscars, the Academy Awards, Hitchcock, Jimmy Stewart. Thank you very much, sir. The great and with the double features in the newsreels, you got a cartoon and a travel talk. And Kitty's matinees on Saturday with cereals, not just Ginger Rogers, but Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon, and on other days, turkey raffles and dish night. Mama could have a set of 52 dishes at the end of the year if she came every week, and she did. And the home team, the bums, the Dodgers at Ebbets Field, forever playing the Yankees. Going to the movies was a different ball game than it is today, when you only get a single feature, no gorgeous lobby to wait in if it's raining. And nowadays, it's one movie, and you're back out on the street again. I defy anyone of today's children to have that same type of emotion or feeling that we had of coming into a theater, which was in those days a theater, not a movie house. There was no TV, there was no competition, it cost you a dime, and you waited patiently from week to week until you could come into something like this. This place had such an effect on me, this Lowe's Kings. I think I was 14, and I had started to go with girls, and this was my first date. I was living in Long Island, and I went to Sheepshead Bay to visit my, my cousin Sharon. And we were walking around, and this really cute guy came over and talked to us. And I was about 15, she was about 12, so right away I had the advantage. And he asked me out for that weekend. It was a Saturday night at the movies. So I said, fine, and I went. And we got to the theater, and it was, it was really, you know, it was really overwhelming. It was so beautiful and big inside, and he was so pleased with himself. I mean, it was like the two of us were going to the Roxy, you know? <laughs> like something really terrific. So we got inside, and I didn't know where we were going to sit. But he was, he, you know, it was the 50s. He was a chain smoker, so there was no question we had to go to the balcony. So I would say that all my contemporaries, 10 years older, 10, 15 years younger, in coming to movies like this, was introduced to sex in the second balconies of theaters. You took the girl out. You brought her here. You had paid. You watch the film, and after about 15 minutes, you try to cover both of yourselves with a blanket, and you started to maul her. But always one eye on the usher that he shouldn't catch you, that you shouldn't get a flashlight right on top of you. I realize it's not very romantic, but that's the way it started. Well, when he got done smoking, he started working on me. I got a little upset, and... and this guy's hands, you know, like going all over. I, I get let out with such a scream. I mean, you couldn't believe it. it. It like resounded in the place. It was like overwhelming. Everyone was like looking at us. I said, I want to get out of here. And he said, okay, okay, let's, let's go. I mean, it must have been a good picture, but I don't remember what it was. We got outside, and we looked across the street. He said, I, I want to make it up to you. I, I want to take you out for a soda or something. Calm down. So we looked across the street around here somewhere, and there was this little shop. He said, no, I'm going to take you to Shrafts. I mean, this was really terrific, right? This is the highlight of my life, Shrafts. I traced back psychologically. I even remember the film I went to see. It was 1940, and it was a, a film called Second Chorus with Fred Astaire and Paulette Goddard. <laughs>
Is this an intermission for the Kings or the final reel? It could easily join the list of movie palaces already demolished or filled with multiple screen theaters, sterile cubby holes which have destroyed the architect's design. Why aren't these people going to the movies? Well, they are, but just to see very few pictures. The studios used to turn out 500 features a year. Now the business is dependent on a few blockbusters. The product just isn't there to fill the theaters with new pictures every week. B pictures have been replaced by TV movies of the week. With many cinemas in the suburbs, a new style of movie going has evolved. Several theaters near the Kings have closed and are up for sale. The proof that the public still is magnetized by the types of magnificent decor once supplied by Rambush and movie palace architects has been evident in Atlanta, Oakland, Providence, and Columbus, where great old theaters have been saved and are now used as performing arts centers, which house symphony orchestras and dance companies. Flatbush is a neighborhood in continuing flux. Can such solutions work here? I've lived in the neighborhood for uh, approximately 50 years. And I've seen many changes take place. And one of the things that really hurt was to see these beautiful theaters closing, particularly the Kings, which uh, even today, uh, I believe, inside is uh, the palace that it was when they first opened it. And there's no question that the community suffered as a result of it, that uh, the type of businesses, in many cases, that uh, we were able to uh, use before haberdashers, ladies' specialty shops uh, were forced to move out because the activity just didn't exist. You see, I'm here already for a number of years while the Lowe's Kings Theater was open. We're never able to close before 3 o'clock in the morning. People first used to come out 3 o'clock from the late, late show. We're always thousands thousands of people. During the day, at night, in the evenings, all the time, and since they closed, it's like quiet in the street, no lights around. We're missing the lights, we're missing the graduations it used to be for the children here. Yeah, I remember a few years back, the Louis King Theater, I graduated there. And I know a lot of people, uh, all my friends, my family, everybody graduated there. And uh, every year since, since then, there's been, uh, been a lot of crowds outside for graduation, like in the end of June. And the um, past couple of years, it just, you know, it's been like, uh, ever since it closed up, it's been dead over here now. We had a manager here, which I knew personally. Her name was Miss Pensica. And she invited many movie stars, like Betty Davis, uh, Joan Crawford, Jack Webb, Cesar Romero, Connie Francis, Connie Stevens. And when they came, the avenue was lit up, and the cars that loaded the streets up. Well, they were double parked, triple parked, and you think that you were in California, where they're having uh, the Academy Awards. It was such a beautiful sight. Brooklyn's finest show place, first run hits, it sure, sure was. Sad to see it not in operation. Everything about it is so magnificent. I used to feel like uh, I was coming to work in a palace. I just lived here. I loved it. Look at these chandeliers. What happened to the chandeliers? Good heavens, you never saw one, not one light ever was out on these chandeliers. They were always serviced all the time. Sad for me to see it this way. Without a, a lot of people walking through the aisles here in the lobby. There seems to be a leak there on that ceiling, on that side. You notice the uh, white spots there? Yes, the, I, I know that's a leak. Yes. I sometimes I wonder if I ever should have retired. I, I really feel that I, I abandoned the ship. I, I feel terrible about it. I, I would never have let it been so neglected. It looks absolutely terrible. You remember having the light put in there? Uh -huh. mm. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Look at this. Oh, I don't believe it. How could anybody be so cruel? Oh, my goodness. This office was like a little dollhouse. 
I had trophies all over it. Awards. The couch was here. The patrons I'd invite them into this office to sit down and talk to me. Everybody that came into this theater was like a guest in my home. And we had a very, very wonderful staff. Everybody worked here like a family. First of all, you couldn't help but love working in the theater. And when the manager loves the theater and tells them how beautiful everything is and treats them as though they were her own family, they in turn do the same thing. So everybody pitched in here and everybody did an excellent job. We used to pop our own corn every morning before starting. But when the, pop, when the corn keep popping, the smell was so great that even in the midst of the movie, the folks would come out to buy popcorn. We only had Coke and orange, but they got tired of it, and our stand manager, Seal, had the bright idea of mixing Coke and orange and call it Orange Coke, that's what. And that used to sell a lot. I took care of the children, and sometimes were very nice, and sometimes were very bad. In order to keep them happy and keep them satisfied with where they're sitting, I had a break up the children's section into grasshoppers for children under 12 and, one, uh, and the seniors and the juniors and all that. And every kid felt so important. They said, oh, I'm going to the grasshopper section. I didn't care where they sat in that, in that particular area because it was near an exit door and they were safe. They were very good children until they started to buy the popcorn. Then when they bought the popcorn, they didn't eat it. They threw it at one another. And he also threw it at the girls. He teased the girls and pulled her hair. And sometimes we had a plain policeman in the audience, which I knew, and he'd show me their badge. So I would tell the children, if you don't behave, I will get the cops over here to put you out. They were little devils. In the eight years I've worked here as an usher, uh, I got to learn a lot about the movie business and uh, how the Kings ran the movie business. Um, it's not that the theater wasn't kept well, it really was kept well. Like, um, like this, this uniform. This, we always made sure we had good uniforms and uh, everything was really kept well. Brass was always shined, uh, theater was kept well. Even the prints were always made sure that they were checked, that they were clear and crisp. Every employee before he went on the floor had to make sure that he wore, or she wore a name plate. The uniform had to be clean. Of course, we used to have, have their uniforms cleaned every two weeks, but their uniforms had to be cleaned. Their shoes had to be polished at all times. They had to wear a tie. Their fingernails had to be clean. And every employee looked like a, a little dream boat. I used to call them, are my dream boats ready? And they used to come out on the floor, ready for, ready for action. And they felt so great walking up and down those aisles. But that couldn't help. It couldn't help it because the movies that Hollywood were making, OK, could not fill a 4,000, 3,000-seat house, such as the King's I mean, like, look inside. Just there alone is 2,000 seats. The new theater's coming out now, only got about 700 seats. And they don't fill them up that often. One night, some movie, not very hot, was showing. So Paul went into the manager and told her that only one person was in the theater. And I said to him, gee, you know, I said, you're the only person here, whatever. Everybody would like to go home. He goes, no, I paid my money. And we had to all sit there and wait until, uh, you know, he went home. And he sat in the theater with his legs up like a king. Uh, we had gone with the wind here. We had uh, Ten Commandments, uh, but we were passed by when uh, Jaws came. We were passed by when Star Wars came. Uh, Why were you passed by? Well, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's because the company just felt that this theater was too much to uh, upkeep. You know, like, like uh, it costs almost $1,000 a month in electric bills. I don't know how many thousands of gallons of oil had to keep the heat this place. And then the continent's maintenance and all this. This is like a gigantic palace. This is like a regular palace. You can look around with the brass, with the, you know, the variety of crystal. And it has to be maintained. And, I mean, the plumbing and everything. 
And that's what, you know, when you have that kind of cost and you're not getting that much budget, like I'll tell you, the neighborhood was also changing. Uh, uh, Flatbush Avenue was changing a lot. A lot of stores were folding up. Uh, people weren't coming in often. We even had one time a mugging here. There was only four people in the audience. Uh, two got bored and I guess decided to mug the third. I didn't see so much about the deterioration of the neighborhood because I was always in here and always doing a lot of publicity work and I was too busy to really take notice. But I would hear about the other theaters and I'd see what was happening with the holdups there and people being afraid to come out to, in the evening. And I knew that one day something, the theater may have to close. It's just impossible to, to keep it up. And I, I would be brokenhearted to be the manager of the theater here that was closing up. It would just tear me apart. Nobody could believe we were going to close. They started closing about three times. Every time, nobody bought. Everybody was happy. The final time, day, everybody was so sad. It was really hard because they thought they were going to tear it down to make a church. Then it was a supermarket. Then it was everything you can think of. So everybody was really very sad. Then they reopened, and we thought this was it. No such luck. The Kings was saved in extremis by the Flatbush Development Corporation, a community group which recently acquired the building and intends to keep it open as Brooklyn's finest show place. like another where people weren't working and you suddenly came into this magnificent edifice even in a gilded dream palace you were often jolted back for a few minutes to the harsh realities of the world outside well-known personalities made pitches for worthy causes the march of dimes the will rogers fund the unemployed if you could afford the price of admission then you were expected to shell out a few cents for those who could not and in these cathedrals of the motion picture, the ushers took up the collection for these secular causes as if you were in church. Thousands of unemployed men and women today are struggling to keep their homes and families together. Won't you help them by sharing your better fortune with them? Remember, sharing does not hurt like suffering. You got a horn of plenty at the movies in those days. You got Gable and Colbert in It Happened One Night, William Powell and Myrna Loy in The Thin Man. As second or B picture, you might get Gene Autry and Roy Rogers and their horses. Stormy day, wild seas lash the... The newsreel with the important events of the day and the trivia. The storm gods are angry. All over the continent, the and you got FDR, a great star at the Lowe's Kings, the only president held over by popular demand on the screen of the newsreels for three terms. And the Oscars, the Academy Awards, Hitchcock, Jimmy Stewart. Thank you very much, sir. And with the double features in the newsreels, you got a cartoon and a travel talk and Kitty's matinees on Saturday with cereals. Not just Ginger Rogers, but Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon, and on other days, turkey raffles and dish night. Mama could have a set of 52 dishes at the end of the year if she came every week, and she did. And the home team, the bums, the Dodgers at Ebbets Field, forever playing the Yankees. Going to the movies was a different ball game than it is today, when you only get a single feature. No gorgeous lobby to wait in if it's raining. And nowadays... I retired when I was 89 years old. And this was my last job. Because when I heard this theater be closed, I couldn't work anymore.
Rap and Rap, the great Chicago architectural firm which designed the Kings, did not foresee that their theaters could close. They thought that they were built to last forever. But the Kings had its troubles from the beginning. It opened its doors on Flatbush Avenue just in time, shortly before the stock market crash of 1929. Had it been planned for a little later, it might never have opened due to the Depression. Lowell's theaters built mighty fortresses and dream palaces, often in neighborhoods where most of the buildings were anything but palatial. Going to the Kings, the most lavish of Flatbush's theaters, was the next best thing to going to the city. And for several years, its films were accompanied by stage shows and vaudeville acts, imported directly from the Capitol on Broadway. The Kings was decorated by Harold W. Rambush, whose firm also specialized in the decoration of churches. It's a wonderful experience to come here to the King's Theater, which I have not visited during the last 50 years when I actually worked on it, to enter these lobbies that are so lush and rich in their expense and in their concept of design. And we wonder really how these owners and operators and producers of movies who built the theaters, why they made them so rich. Because they had, whether knowingly or unknowingly, realized that besides showing a picture and entertaining the people, they wanted to give them a lift, give them a sense of their own importance. And the public who came into these theaters were, for a short time, for the hours they were here, they felt like kings or barons or wealthy people. So we find in lighting, in mirrors, in murals, in architectural elaboration, it was largely on the Renaissance. A real historian. Big names as Eddie Leonard, Eddie Foy and the Seven Foys, Julius Tannen, and as the people came, the theaters grew. You had people like Al Jolson come in, Eddie Cantor, Schnauzel Durante. The theaters turned into big palaces, palaces all over the city and in the hinterland, in the suburbs. And it was a great pleasure to come into a theater like King's and every visit to find the same people, the same faces sitting in the same seats. For most of us, that is kids of my age, my generation, our parents came over from the old country, very poor. Rarely did they get into a palace as gorgeous as this. And rarely would they ever have dreamt that their children would, every Saturday, come into their own palace, place themselves, and for three hours, behold magic. <laughs> I'm standing in the middle of the organ lift here at Lowe's King's Theater. The organ lift is the only thing that is left of the instrument. The organ which was here was known as a Wonder Morton because these theaters were wonder theaters. And as you can see, they really were wonderful. The organ was installed in 1929 about the time that the silent film era was ending. They were certainly the, one of the most intricate things that you can imagine. They were built specifically, of course, to accompany silent films. But since the silent film era was over, they were, of course, used for various other things. You couldn't believe the things that that we were required to play. The popular music of the day, Tchaikovsky, Bach, whatever there was, that's what we had to do. You have to understand that this was the depression and where else for 10 cents could you be transported from the slums of East New York and Brownsville where one street
started in this business 70, 80 years ago. And that time, we used to crank. It was an old Edison machine. We used to crank hard with bigger films, only five minutes. And the first job I had, it was on the Crystal Hall on 14th Street, New York. A little later, we started with the sun. And we had the record and films. But many times, the needle jumped off the record. And boy, that it was hell. We had to take off the reel from the machine and rewind again and start all over again. I, uh, I work on the Astro in New York and many, many theaters. And the last job, it was in, in the King. To close this theater. That's something that anybody can feel. Well, our architectural expert would feel that this was really bastardizing architecture it, because it was not correct according to any style. Every effort was just made to make it as voluptuous, as gorgeous as possible. No restraint of any kind was put on it. If an effect could be attained in some more or less legitimate historical manner, it was used because it was purely show business. Mortal, rambling the rose of the wild moon. Round the corner and down your way comes Arthur Tracy, your street singer. Mortal, rambling the rose of the wild moon. With your fragrance divine Rosebud of the days of my childhood Watch you bloom in the wildwood And I hoped you'd be mine Oh, how wonderful to be back in this King's Theatre again, singing on its stage. Brings back the orchestra, the conductor, beautiful audiences. Besides the piano, my violin, there were 25 other musicians at the opening of the King's Theatre. The orchestra was conducted by David Pazansky. It was a gala affair that opening week when we played for the opening movie in which Dolores Del Rio was a star. We also played a couple of overtures and accompanied several other famous, then famous actors and actresses who appeared at the opening. Vaudeville began years and years ago with such...